Hi, everybody, and welcome to the September 2022 edition of Streets for All Happy Hour. We're very excited to have Richard Bloom, uh, State Assembly Member for District 50, as our special guest. A couple Before of more months, anyway. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here. As uh, I'll, I'll mute my mic. <laughs> no problem. Um, before we get to our conversation with Richard, we're going to give you an update on some state bills uh, that we are pushing for and hoping the governor signs, an update on Healthy Streets LA, talk about Venice Boulevard for all, announce a few endorsements, and go over some wins and fails of the month, and we'll get to our conversation with Richard. Our icebreaker this time is, what bill are you most worried about the governor vetoing? And given the governor has not said anything about most of the bills that are on his desk that we have sponsored or supported, uh, this is very relevant. So I'm gonna pass it over to Mark, who's gonna answer this question and give us a state update. Hey everyone, uh, it's Mark Vuksevich, he, him from the state team. Uh, I think the bill I'm most worried about him vetoing is um, SB 457. It's one of our sponsored bills with Senator Portantino and it's a tax rebate for not having a car. We'll actually talk about that in a few minutes. Um, I don't know. Worries me though. Anything, anything with a price tag in the governor worries me. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I want to talk about our bills. So we have uh, five sponsored bills and we had 10 bills that we were supporting, uh, nine right now. So our five sponsored bills were SB 932, which is planning for bikes, SB 457, which I just mentioned. And we have um, you know a few others, but the one I want to really highlight is AB 2264, which is with our uh, lovely assembly member, Assembly Member Loon, which requires pedestrian head starts. Um, all of these are on the governor's desk right now, and he has until September uh, 30th to sign. Actually, next slide here. Um, oh, actually, yep. Yeah. SB 47, this is the bill I was just talking about. We got some really good media coverage on this in both the New York Times, it was mentioned, Washington Post, other sources as well. And yeah, it's our bill uh, that would give $1,000 to um, um, lower income residents who don't have a car to reward them for, for that. Uh, next slide. And just to repeat, um, the ledge session ended on August 30th, which means that the governor now has until uh, September 30th to sign or veto all legislation. We had our first loss recently. That was AB 1919. Um, Eli Lippman actually just put that in the chat, which was the free uh, transit for students bill. Um, and yeah, but hopefully we have a lot more successes to come. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Michael to answer the question of the day and, and talk about Healthy Streets LA. Thanks, Mark. I'm most concerned about AB 2097, um, Laura Friedman and Senator Porrentino's bill to revise how or get rid of parking minimums within a half mile of transit in California. Parking reform has never come this close, um, but our own mayor, Eric Garcetti, came out against it, and there's a lot of thinking that we feel is incorrect, so praying that one makes it. Um, so just a reminder, Healthy Streets LA is a city of Los Angeles ballot measure that would mandate the city automatically implement its own mobility plan. About three weeks ago, um, we were at LA City Council and they had the opportunity to either adopt us into law or send us to the ballot. And rather than uh, tell you, I'm just going to play a quick two minute video um, so everybody can get caught up. Here we go. Members, every year, hundreds of people are killed and seriously injured while using Los Angeles streets. The proponents of this measure are absolutely right when they talk about the implementation of the mobility plan being unacceptably and unconscionably slow. The city of LA has had years, years to implement the mobility plan, which was adopted back in 2015. There is no greater public safety hazard than the conditions of our streets and how Angelinos are enduring the impacts of the unfulfilled promises that have been made to make safer streets for everyone. We, we, we passed Vision Zero seven years ago. Uh, a, a shamefully small part of it has uh, been done. A pedestrian or a cyclist is killed on our streets every three days. And these are real people with real stories and real families who have real hopes and, and, and real dreams. And I have to say, I am embarrassed and ashamed that since 2015, we've only been able to build 3% of the mobility plan. It is shameful. I too am frustrated with the slow pace of progress that our cities have seen when it comes to implementing safe 
streets. To see this many people turn out to demand safe streets, to demand bike lanes, to demand pedestrian infrastructure, it's so different from what I've seen in LA for so many years. Please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 13 eyes. Okay, let's move on to item 15. So uh, we are obviously disappointed that they did not take action. We are working on a campaign that in this void between when voters vote us in or city council eventually does their version. Um, and now that they start doing what they say they want to do and not just miss streets in this weird void that we're in. So um, I am now going to pass it over to Katrina for an update on Venice Boulevard. Thanks, Michael. Um, I was going to say that the bill that I was most worried about the governor vetoing was AB 1919. That was the bill that I picked when we were practicing this yesterday. And I just want to reiterate that it's such a disappointment how this went down. It had a lot of support from the legislature and a lot of advocates. And, you know, I know that it's so difficult for, you know, people to apply for all the different kinds of public benefits and this sort of streamlined the process for a lot of families. And it's a disappointment. But I'm here to talk to you all about Venice Boulevard for All and give an update on this project. So as you might know, um, LADOT, after you know, a few years of engagement, is finally getting started on a road reconfiguration project that would add a protected bike lane to the stretch between Lincoln and National Boulevard, as you can see on this graphic here. And it even the protected bike lane even continues further to the east, all the way towards Fairfax. And it would also replace one of the car lanes with a 24 seven bus lane. And there's a number of reasons that LADOT is able to restripe it. And they're gonna do it um, in concert with the repaving schedule since a lot of this pavement is scheduled for repaving. And we're really excited about this project. We've been engaging with them for the last six months at least or so. But now things are finally moving along. So if you go to the next slide, um, I want to update the group here that LADOT is still running their survey. It's going to be on through September. We really encourage all of you who have yet to fill it out to go and give your thoughts on the proposed reconfiguration for Venice Boulevard, express your support. It's really important. Right now, LADOT is telling us that they've got about 70% support on the survey. In addition to that, they had some in-person and virtual community engagement events, including the Palms Community Walk in partnership with the Neighborhood Council and a virtual open house at which uh, public comment also outweighed um, supporters also um, outnumbered commenters opposed at a rate of about 71%. If you go to the next slide, this will um, here's just a few nice pictures um, of the Palms Community Walk, including a number of our wonderful volunteers. And I want to especially thank our volunteers who've come out repeatedly, continued to engage with LADOT, Neighborhood Council, and other elected officials on this. And on the next slide, you can see the timeline from LADOT. We are um, almost at the tail end of the engagement cycle, so please, please get your thoughts out to LADOT when you can. And as far as we can tell, we're tracking for implementation at the end of this year still. If you have any questions about this project, please go ahead and, and ask me, Katrina at streetsforall.org. And now I'll pass it over to Olga to talk about our endorsements. Olga, before you start, sorry guys, I need, having a technical issue, I just need to refresh. One second. Yeah, all good. I'm gonna be talking about some endorsements that we're gonna be doing. Um, very exciting news to share with you all. We're especially, I'm excited this election cycle, we're trying to really have a hand in the small cities, not just city of LA. So that'll be one of the things that I'm going to talk about. We have announcements for Clover City, WeHo, and Santa Monica. 
Olga, do you want to do your icebreaker and I'll be up once you're oh, done? Oh, oh my gosh, I completely forgot. My uh, number one bill that I'm super, super nervous about is um, 922 Weiner's uh, CEQA uh, bike lane bill. I think we all know that CEQA has been used often, uh, not the way it was intended to be, uh, especially when it comes to building things that we already know are good for the environment. Uh, so <laughs> that's my big fear. Um, okay, endorsements. Um, First off, we're so excited to be endorsing two major ballot measures. Um, the first is Check the Sheriff. That's going to be County Measure A. Uh, we joined the Check the Sheriff uh, Coalition in response to cyclist Dijon Kizzy uh, being pulled over by the sheriffs uh, for a minor traffic violation and losing his life in the process. Um, today, we saw the sheriffs going up against Metro. So uh, many people don't think these issues intersect with what we do, but um, that's something that we really want to take more of a stance on. The other ballot measure we're going to be endorsing is United to House LA. It's going to be city measure ULA, I believe. Um, and that's going to be a real estate transaction tax on homes over $5 million to help fund uh, permanent supportive housing. All right, so first up, uh, Culver City Council, we're so excited to announce we're going to be endorsing Freddie and Alex. Um, no surprise there. We all know that Alex has done an incredible job with transit in Culver City. Um, and Freddie is a king who is going to help keep move Culver City uh, going. Uh, next slide. For WeHo, we are going to be These three are all going to be amazing for WeHo Transit. Um, there's a lot of really good candidates running in WeHo. Um, uh, so this was kind of a hard choice, but super excited about this one. And then next slide. And then lastly, in Santa Monica, we are going to be endorsing Jesse Zwick, Caroline Tarosis, and Natalia Zelenskaya. Uh, I should know how to pronounce that better because I'm Eastern European, but I don't. Um, we're super stoked to be <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, we're super excited to be supporting these candidates who are not only amazing, who's intertwined significantly as well. Um, if you want to support any of these candidates, we'll be sending out a blast soon with ways you can get involved. And as always, feel free to shoot me an email if you want to help out with our election stuff. It's olga at streetsforall.org. We still have more races to announce, um, but you'll hear about those next time. So I'm going to hand it over to Adrian to talk about wins and fails. Thank you so much, Olga. Uh, so the, the bill that I am hoping the governor is going to sign is AB 2147, which would legalize um, the practice that's typically known as jaywalking. Um, I hate that term though, um, where people often will cross at unmarked intersections. And people do this for a lot of reasons because of failed city planning, um, not having enough pedest pedestrian infrastructure. And so it's really a victim blaming to make that illegal. So I'm really hoping that this ends up uh, passing the governor's desk. So I'm gonna share a win of the month. Um, this one is really exciting. Uh, the West Hollywood Transportation Commission has approved a class four protected bike lane down Fountain. Uh, this is uh, gonna be a really important east-west corridor. Uh, I've biked down this, uh, this corridor a lot and it's a really, harrowing experience. Uh, so there's uh, now, uh, this is gonna be going to, the, uh, to um, the West Hollywood City Council in October for them to make the final decision. So stay tuned, we are going to update you on uh, how, how that pans out and uh, hope that you can lend your support to this. And um, thank you for the West Hollywood Commission for, for doing this. I'm gonna to toss it over to Michael to talk about the, will, uh, the fail of the month. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so Willoughby is a east west street through West Hollywood and city of LA. It's actually the border. And there's a traffic calming uh, experiment. And uh, basically, these NIMBY forces successfully uh, railroaded the survey and killed the traffic diverter. Um, Willoughby is often used by cars uh, trying to avoid Melrose or Santa Monica at rush hour. And now thanks to this diverter being gone, they're going to get full access to it again. So we're hoping to bring this back in the future. 
Okay, um, quick reminder, if you want to help us out, you can subscribe to our socials at Streets for All, and you can volunteer at streetsforall.org slash get dash involved. And we have great new merch for sale. Every uh, sale is a donation that helps the cause. Uh, quick preview for October, we're going to have Council Member Mike Bonin on. It should be a very interesting conversation. This is uh, less than a month before the election. Um, Mike is not running for re-election, and so it should be a very candid and interesting and animated conversation. So very excited to have uh, Richard Bloom. Uh, Assemblymember Bloom was born in Philadelphia, raised in Altadena in West LA, where he attended Fairfax High School. He attended UCLA and later UC Berkeley before earning his Juris Doctor from Loyola Law. He practiced family law for nearly 30 years before serving 13 years in the Santa Monica City Council, where he served as mayor three times, as mayor pro tem twice. In 2012, uh, Richard was elected to the California State Assembly, where he has served as a stalwart defender of the environment and sought to break the wheel on housing restrictions. Some notable legislation include AB 2299, the Granny Flats Bill, which required local governments to adopt a secondary unit ordinance to allow for more housing. AB 2264, which standardizes LPIs at city intersections, making it safer for pedestrians by giving them a head start to walk across the intersection. And that bill, as we mentioned, is currently waiting the governor's signature. Uh, Richard lives in Santa Monica with his wife of 40 years and two chickens. Welcome, Richard. How's it going? Thank, thank you for being here. Um, our, our, uh, our, our two uh, millennial sons have uh, moved out of the house. <laughs> So we're left with the chickens. Hence, hence the chickens, got it. Hence the um, chickens, exactly. <laughs> so I'm, uh, we have a number of questions for you, if you don't mind, and then we're gonna also take some audience questions. So the first question, I'm gonna turn it over to Katrina to ask. Thanks, Michael. Hi, Assembly Member Bloom, it's great to have you. Um, I wanted to jump right in, invite you to say a few words, but also talk about your bill, AB 2264. We're of course very excited about it and we've been helping to promote it. And of course, as we mentioned before, AB 2264 mandates leading pedestrian intervals at signalized crosswalks. Are you optimistic about its passage? And can you tell our audience more about how this bill came to be and what kinds of conversations you had with advocates and constituents in order to make it as successful as it's been so far? I'm always optimistic uh, about my bills uh, making it through. We work really hard on them during uh, the legislative uh, cycle. Um, so that by the time we get to the finish line, they're ready, they've been refined, they've been amended uh, through the committee process, and uh, uh, hopefully are, are going to uh, uh, be something that the governor will uh, look favorably upon. Um, this one's important. Uh, um, oh, you asked where it came from. Hmm. Um, it might have been uh, somebody named Michael Schneider or somebody that has a name similar to that. Um, who uh, brought it to our office and said, hey, um, uh, we'd, we'd like you to carry this legislation. It looked good to me. Um, it makes sense. I've, uh, um, I don't know if this uh, qualifies strictly as a, uh, as a traffic calming measure, uh, but things that make our streets safer for uh, pedestrians and bicyclists um, have been of uh, great interest to me since before I uh, even ran for city council, um, and, and that was back in 19, uh, I don't want to even want to tell you, it was 1996 was my first race for city council, which I lost badly, and it might have been um, because I was not terribly well liked in Santa Monica, or at least not universally liked, maybe is a better way to put it, because I was the president of a neighborhood group, and we were pushing traffic calming. So if you drive through uh, uh, the Sunset Park area in uh, um, uh, in Santa Monica on Cloverfield or 23rd Street or any of the uh, uh, most of the streets that parallel those uh, those two streets, you'll see some bulb outs. You'll see uh, 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 speed humps. Um, those are my fault, <laughs> uh, uh, a result of my hard work on uh, on that issue. But th th I mean, we're seriously talking about uh, an effort that goes back to probably um, 1991, 92, something like that, when that plan was under development. Uh, so uh, uh, leading pedestrian uh, uh, indicators give pedestrians a, a head start into the intersection, um, as, uh, as was uh, mentioned. Um, 
that means that you're visible, you have a head start, um, automobiles can see you, and there's far less likelihood um, that you'll be uh, uh, struck by a, uh, by a car. Uh, uh, we know, uh, uh, you guys all know the statistics, uh, um, how things are not getting better, they're getting worse for pedestrians. And so we really need efforts like this to make a difference. Thank you. I think I have the next question. Um, we've been quite frustrated by the slow progress at Caltrans and wanted to get your thoughts. On one hand, we have leaders like Tokes at Calsta and Tony Tavares now at headquarters that say all the right things and create policies that for Caltrans are light, light years ahead of where they were five and 10 years ago. But on the other hand, they seem to have an inordinate amount of this mid-level staff that has been designing just for cars for decades and warships, things like level of service metric, making change really difficult. Uh, how do you think we can best align our state's climate goals with what is and what is quickly becoming a climate emergency with our state's agencies and get more action instead of just good sounding words from the leaders up top? Well, um, it probably has to come from uh, uh, the elected leaders. Um, Caltrans needs to know what the policy direction is, where the state wants to head. And um, that starts with the governor and works its way down through uh, um, uh, through the legislature. Um, uh, bills that uh, uh, we, we have seen um, that don't make it through the legislature, like th there have been bills on leg level of service and um, uh, 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 various uh, uh, metrics by uh, uh, by, by which speeds on roads and other, uh, and, and whether bike lanes are going to be located and, uh, uh, pedestrian amenities and the like, um, uh, they don't always make it through the legislative process and, uh, uh, Caltrans does pay attention to what's going on. Uh, and you're right. There's a lot of people there who are trained in building roads and they build them a certain way. And that's what they're training tells them and it's really difficult to change the direction even a little bit of a massive bureaucracy and uh, Caltrans qualifies as a massive bureaucracy. It's multi-level, it, um, um, it has uh, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of employees and they do tend to stick around for a long time. Um, so it's, it, it's uh, um, I think, something that is time consuming that requires um, uh, leadership. It requires the kind of leadership that um, uh, motivates, for example, in the legislature, um, you know, we need to find ways for uh, leaders like myself to uh, motivate our colleagues to look at things differently. And that's not always easy. And you learn that. Um, I didn't know about this, uh, um, it looked like a forced right turn. Uh, was it on Willoughby? Um, the diverter? Yeah. yeah the, well, you know, I call it a forced turn. Um, old fashioned. That's old school. Um, some of those were supposed to be part of that traffic plan back in, uh, in the nineties. Um, here it's what got people worked up then. Um, and, uh, uh, the way you just related, uh, how that went down that, uh, uh, there were residents in the neighborhood who apparently didn't like it. Well, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that elected officials pay attention to. Doesn't always change our mind, but we are paying attention to what constituents like and what they don't like. Um, sometimes you have to um, take a different point of view in spite of what your constituents think, because um, uh, you've studied the issue and you understand the benefits. Sometimes it's worth taking a risk and doing a pilot project to show people um, uh, that uh, um, something new will work. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Ocean Park Boulevard um, uh, in the Sunset Park area, east of, of Lincoln, by the business park, it's a four lane, uh, uh, two lanes in each direction uh, road. Um, but down between Lincoln and 23rd, it also used to be um, two lanes in each direction. Um, there were a number of accidents there, including one that I witnessed uh, when I was on the council, when a, 
uh, a middle-aged woman was crossing uh, uh, the street and was struck by a car. And I watched her as she flipped over the, uh, the roof of the car and uh, suffered some very serious injuries. Um, uh, we implemented uh, a, uh, uh, a road diet there, uh, uh, reduced the, uh, uh, the streets uh, to uh, one in each direction. Um, and residents went crazy because, well, you know why, because it was gonna increase traffic and it was gonna take longer to get from point A to point B. And how can you do that? And it's gonna back up traffic into the neighborhood. And um, you know, we heard all the things that we always hear. Um, the countervailing um, thinking was it's going to slow traffic down and it's going to make it safer uh, for people. We're gonna see fewer injuries and deaths. And that's exactly um, what has happened that was implemented now probably 15 years ago. Um, and so, and the area has been studied and there's been a significant reduction in fatalities and, uh, and, and injuries. Um, and so these things work, but sometimes it takes a long time to, uh, 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 to change uh, the perception of, of folks whose initial reaction is very negative. Thank you. Over to Katrina. Thanks. So I'm going to ask about a different bill, AB 2097. And after a lot of back and forth on the parking minimums topic over several cycles, you and your colleagues finally managed to pass AB 2097, which- That's a Friedman's parking. bill, right? That's right. That's right. It's the one uh, prohibiting minimum parking requirements near new residential and commercial developments near transit. And you may know this bill has a lot of visibility in the context of the other we're supporting. And it seems like the political winds are more favorable this time compared to previous legislative cycles. But again, how optimistic are you? And what do you think is different this time? What do you, what's your response to those like the LA City Council who erroneously call parking requirements a bargaining chip with developers or something like that? Yeah, well, that, um, you know, uh, uh, is a result of uh, it having become an amenity that uh, you bargain for um, or bargain around when you want to include affordable housing. And that's uh, unfortunate, but there is some, uh, 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 some truth to, uh, to that dynamic. And it's what resulted in some of the affordable um, uh, housing advocates not liking the bill. But I think, oh, I think this is the third year, am I right, um, that she's carried the bill. Um, and um, it seems like more and more folks are coming on board and getting comfortable uh, with the notion, which that's the other big piece of this is that people are like, you know, same with that road diet issue, you know, oh my God, how can you do this? People are going to park on the street. I'll never find a parking place for my car. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, developers are going to build uh, 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 developments with no parking. God forbid that should happen. Um, but, um, you know, th that's also erroneous thinking. Um, uh, but I, th I think that more and more members have become comfortable um, with the notion. That's why it passed uh, 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 through this year. I don't remember the amendments that uh, 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 Assembly Member Friedman took, but I know that she did take, take some amendments along the way to pare it down and you know, uh, that can be frustrating, especially um, for folks like yourselves who are, you know, ardent advocates for a more pure, if you will, form of, um, uh, uh, of the bill. Um, but I would think that having uh, made it all the way to the governor, um, there's a good chance that it'll be, that it'll be signed. I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, so um, uh, you, you can't put much stock in what I say about what the governor may or may not do. Um, he, uh, uh, and this was true of Governor Brown too. Um, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a very unpredictable process and you just never know when, uh, uh, I was fortunate in that only a couple of my bills have been over, over a decade have been, have been vetoed. Um, uh, but, uh, um, you just never know when that's going to happen. Can you send him a text and ask him to sign 2097? <laughs> I All don't right. think that's going to work. 
school. <laughs> uh, switching gears to the Coastal Commission. You, but you do, you know, as advocates, you do need to keep those cards and letters uh, coming uh, uh, so that he knows that there is a constituency um, uh, behind this. And he yeah. respects the author too. Um, uh, uh, you know, Laura Friedman's a very respected uh, uh, member. She's the chair of a very important, uh, uh, the Transportation Committee, a very important committee. And uh, um, so, uh, you know, all those things play into the ultimate result. We'll keep the letters coming. Switching gears to the Coastal Commission. Um, the Coastal Commission was created 50 years ago to protect our beaches and state parks by the beach. And some would say it's done a pretty good job of that. On the other hand, it controls parking on PCH. Um, and it insists on having huge parking lots and street parking along our beaches. I've been in Caltrans meetings where Caltrans has shot down ideas saying that the Coastal Commission won't allow them uh, to remove parking to make room for other things. PCH is already one of the most dangerous corridors for cyclists and pedestrians, and it's even dangerous for drivers. Um, mandating a huge amount of street parking makes it nearly impossible to do things that might let people get to and from the beach outside of cars, such as bus lanes or bike lanes on PCH. Do you agree with our assessment of the Coastal Commission? And if so, how can we reform them to better align with our climate goals and allow for more progressive road design? So uh, um, for better or worse, I'm a former Coastal Commissioner um, uh, and uh, served for three or four years um, uh, when I was on the Santa Monica City Council and before, immediately be in the years immediately before um, uh, becoming an assembly member. Um, and um, first of all, I, I think you have to um, understand that the Coastal Commission and the actions they take, um, and I know you know this, um, is governed by the Coastal Act, um, which is a, a part of the Constitution. So it's um, uh, taken very seriously uh, by the Commission, uh, protecting the Coastal Act, a main pillar of which is uh, uh, maintaining and improving access for everyone to the uh, uh, coastal resources that are one of the things that make California uh, really special. And I know you all agree with that. Um, uh, uh, they, that that's their mission. And, uh, and they take it really seriously. Um, sometimes uh, the um, perceived constraints of the, or dictates of the, of the Coastal Act come into conflict with other very important uh, priorities for the state, like affordable housing and even market rate housing. Um, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, parking is, a, is, a, is another one. So um, for the longest time, uh, the automobile was seen as the way that people accessed the uh, the coast. Um, you take a, a city like Santa Monica, how do most people get to the beach? Well, some people walk and some people ride their bikes and we'll talk about years past or decades past. Um, but by and large, most people would um, uh, would drive. And so there was this inherent conflict between um, uh, if we were reducing parking, Santa Monica also has, I think it was around 3,000 uh, uh, parking places and is seen as one of the uh, most accessible, accessible uh, uh, places along the coast where you can actually get out, out to the beach. And you, know, you see that in the uh, numbers of people who, uh, 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 who are at the beach on, uh, on a nice summer day. Um, when uh, uh, commissions in the past have been faced with uh, projects that, uh, or proposals that might reduce the number of parking places, that has been seen as a direct challenge to access um, uh, to the coast and a direct violation of the uh, uh, dictates of the, of, of the Coastal Act. Um, I think we've seen in the last decade or so, um, uh, some uh, uh, rethinking uh, of uh, 
uh, of that philosophy because it's uh, obviously uh, changing. Uh, pe more people are accessing uh, accessing the uh, the coast by walking, by particularly by biking, by using public transit, um, and uh, um, uh, so I think a, um, there's a. Uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure you know it hasn't changed enough um, uh, 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 to satisfy your, satisfy your concerns, but I do think that the pendulum is beginning to swing and there's more consideration given to um, uh, uh, relaxing some of the uh, parking restrictions. We um, in, in uh, uh, Santa Monica um, uh, and in Venice, as, as you know, there have been uh, uh, battles over uh, uh, parking like on PCH that you were referring to. And um, uh, uh, it's always those, those uh, precious, uh, those those spaces are seen as precious resources, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, commission doesn't want to uh, typically uh, reduce those number of spaces. However, um, the countervailing uh, 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 access issue is, I would say, predominantly for bicyclists um, who I uh, um, um, you know, I don't need to convince you, are faced with very precarious uh, and unsafe conditions on, uh, on, on PCH. And if we could remove the parking um, and uh, install uh, or build better uh, 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 bike facilities and uh, protected lanes and, and that kind of thing, we'd be not only improving access in my view, but uh, 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 dramatically, uh, uh, likely dramatically uh, increasing uh, uh, the safety of bicyclists. We also need, by the way, to um, have better crossings uh, because every year, both bicyclists and people trying to cross from one side of PCH to the other um, are, uh, are, there's just way too many deaths every year. It's, it's a pretty tragic situation. A um, little bit of good news uh, in, in that regard is, uh, um, there's a uh, uh, park uh, 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 that's currently under construction in uh, Pacific Palisades that uh, is built on fill um, uh, that's been deposited there over several decades. Um, it, uh, a ravine was, uh, or canyon was filled in uh, because the earth was starting to move and uh, uh, it needed to be stabilized. And uh, uh, the area on top, is, it's now uh, complete and a uh, park is uh, uh, nearing its completion there. Um, the parking, uh, at least ac uh, the access um, uh, for both, both uh, uh, many, for anybody who accesses the beach, but uh, it's adjacent to a parking uh, area is across the street on the west side of, of PCH. And there's no easy way to get from that parking area um, or the beach, um, uh, uh, if you were to bicycle there, um, there's no easy way to get across to the park. Um, in the last year's budget at uh, uh, my request, uh, uh, I think it was something in the neighborhood of $11 million was funded for a pedestrian um, uh, uh, and uh, bike friendly uh, uh, bridge that will allow you to get from one side to the other. Um, uh, and, and be safe. That's uh, in the planning stage now, it'll take a couple of years to finish that project. Sorry, that was way too long-winded and you really were just asking about the Coastal Commission. I wasn't trying to distract from that, but it all, you know, it all ties together. No problem. And I do think the winds are changing because Caltrans a couple months ago announced that they're proposing removing 2000 parking spaces to make room for class two bike lanes on 16 miles of PCH, which is exciting. Is that in, uh, what area is that in? Or is that all along? Uh... That's uh, Eastern Malibu. So Great. well, let me tell you that uh, there's a uh, PCH task force that meets uh, uh, periodically um, and uh, addresses these kinds of issues. Um, there's a multitude of them, but it involves uh, Santa Monica, Malibu, uh, city and county of Los Angeles, um, PD sheriffs, uh, 
fire. Um, and it's uh, pretty active in identifying and takes a frustratingly long time to make some of the improvements, but I think that you could actually bring some uh, positive advocacy. Um, uh, it meets, uh, uh, Sebastian, how many times a year does the PCH task force meet? Like maybe he, he four just times? put it in the chat, October, 2022 is the next one. Ah, okay, there you go. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, okay, so a um, couple more questions and then we'll take some audience questions. Want to talk to you about AB 1919. Um, the bill would have provided fair free transit to youth. We had asked the legislature and specifically the Senate and assembly budget committees, the latter of which you sit on, um, to consider funding this, but couldn't get it done. Yesterday, um, it was very timely for this conversation, the governor vetoed it, saying he supported the concept, but couldn't support it without a dedicated funding source. Why do you think billions were provided for capital projects, but nothing was provided to help youth transit riders struggling with inflation and recovery from the pandemic? And I think we all feel it's especially egregious, given the governor's initial proposal for billions and billions of dollars to people that drive um, when gas prices were higher, but we couldn't find money for this. So we'd love your thoughts. Well, um, uh, that was a leading question, um, but uh, um, the uh, I, I think that by by the way, I chair the uh, uh, relevant budget subcommittee here um, and have for ten years. So um, it's not just that I sit on the budget committee that makes my opinion on on, on this important. But at this point in time. Um, uh, and I read very quickly the governor's uh, veto message uh, when I found out you wanted to talk. I didn't even know he vetoed it, but uh, Sebastian uh, texted it over to me and, and I had a quick look at it. Um, he talks about uh, 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 this being an ongoing expense, and that is a significant budget issue that we have had over the last uh, two or three years in particular, where we've had these enormous uh, surpluses um, but they are, um, uh, for the most part, uh, involving a spike in resources that we will only see once. Um, and that's primarily because they are grant money from the federal government, that's particularly true this year, or uh, resulting from capital gains um, uh, that people are taking because the stock market has been doing so well and uh, when investors sell stock, they, or or real estate, uh, they frequently incur capital gains, and uh, but but that's not like um, that's not a predictable ongoing resource for the state, and so we try. Um, uh, good budgeting requires us to try very hard to spend one-time resources on things that only occur once. So things like capital projects, um, uh, building a. a a uh, protected bike lane would be an example of a one-time capital uh, project or a, a traffic calming uh, installation, but also um, uh, uh, road repairs and uh, capital road projects and things like that that are uh, repairs that are identifiable individual uh, projects. For um, uh, other things like uh, um, like build. Uh, 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 new facilities um, that are uh, planned out over a long period of time. Um, we try to identify, it's important uh, um, uh, in the budgeting process to identify a, uh, a ongoing long-term resource. Um, and um, this, this project is uh, um, uh, uh, important. Uh, uh, project, um, uh, the program uh, that's called for an AB 1919 is important, but um, it's, it's not the kind of thing you would do just one or two years. It's the kind of thing that you want to do on an ongoing basis. And so that's the, uh, uh, the one thing that the governor is, is calling out. Um, my recollection is that uh, um, Assemblymember Holden um, did have a budget ask, um, uh, and I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of a half billion dollars or so. That might have been last year. Um, uh, I think it was this year also. Um, 
and uh, I, um, that wasn't funded as part of the budget. Um, uh, members have uh, have the ability to um, uh, make requests in in the budget. Not all of them get funded. Um, it's a little bit. Uh, it's something I have some input into, um, but uh, how it gets finalized is a little bit beyond my pay grade. I don't want. I'm not trying to cop out on 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 that. But um, uh, uh, if if I, my my recollection is that it was several hundred million dollars, and those are very. That's a that's a large amount of money, um, and the larger the budget ask. The less likely it is, unless it's a uh, uh, funding request that's broadly supported in the uh, uh, in the caucus, and we're talking right now about um, asks that are either from the assembly or separately uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from the Senate. Thank you. Over to Olga. Um, Assembly Member Bloom, you're actually my representative, and I was very excited when you announced you're running for BOS, Board of Supervisors, for those who don't know, um, and I was very disappointed when you uh, left the race, but all of us were kind of curious what you think your future involves, whether it's related to politics or chickens. <laughs> um, well, I um, suspect there will probably be chickens in my life for a while. Um, uh, uh, we uh, uh, have for my wife and I for uh, uh, most of our uh, life together, lives together have also had a dog, but our dog passed away a couple of years ago. And we're in a state of transition now where uh, um, I'm retiring from the legislature. We have a new grandchild uh, who uh, uh, celebrated her first half birthday today. She's six months old. Um, she lives in San Francisco, and so um, uh, going back and forth to see her has uh, suddenly become a really big priority in our lives. Um, uh, I, I can't tell you uh, um, uh, what I'll be doing because I'm not sure myself. Um, I have discussed and uh, uh, applied for an appointment to uh, the bench. Um, there's uh, uh, that's not something that's secret. Uh, 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 that's in the hands of the governor um, after a uh, very long vetting process um, that may not end until April or May. And so it may be several months and that may happen never. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's like your bills, you know, the, <laughs> that, that you prioritize. You just don't know exactly how things are going to end, but you put your best effort in and uh, fill out the paperwork and go to interviews and um, different process than the bill process, but some similarities also. Um, and beyond that, I don't really have a plan B yet. Um, uh, uh, as of right now, I'm uh, uh, still a legislator until uh, uh, the end of November. And so I'll continue to serve my constituents uh, 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 out of our district office. Uh, primarily out of our district office and uh, um, that'll keep me busy for the next couple of months although I am taking a little bit of time off to uh, um, see a little bit of Italy in a few weeks. So um, we don't normally we're going to go to some audience questions now. Um, we don't normally spotlight audience members but in this case I think it's appropriate while I ask the question so um, Louie I'm going to go ahead and spotlight you. I don't know if you guys know each other. I'm assuming you do. We do. We do. We do. Hi, Richard. Um, good to see you. He's a phenomenal volunteer in, uh, in, in Hollywood. And so uh, and a candidate, if I'm not mistaken. You you might be correct about that. And <laughs> candidate uh, Louis asked, what's the top transit priority you think your successor should push for? What's <laughs> one what's one thing you wish you could have done but didn't happen? And then he wrote, asking for a friend. Um you know, uh, uh, that's an easy one for me to answer. Um, uh, I, I think uh, it's extremely important for uh, uh, Los Angeles to experiment with congestion pricing. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if that surprises you or not. Uh, I was asked to uh, carry that legislation. Um, I don't want to go into a, a lot of details because I don't want to, you know, I 
there was a lot of back and forth and discussion, but then um, uh, we didn't move forward with, with it. And that was over um, three, maybe four years. Um, uh, but during that period of time, I got a, uh, um, I, I had the opportunity to see congestion pricing in action um, uh, in Milan uh, and in uh, London. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And I saw it working. I was briefed in both places. Um, uh, I've read up on it in uh, uh, New York City. Um, and everywhere uh, the congestion pricing, this, this won't surprise you, and you probably, because you're all advocates in this space, you probably know this, when congestion pricing is proposed, it can take different forms and it's, you know, tailored to, um, uh, uh, to uh, the individual uh, cities and, and uh, regions where it's implemented, but it is uniformly despised, um, except by a core group of advocates who, um, you know, muscle it through whatever process is necessary. Um, and it's usually like 60, 40, 70, 30 in terms of um, uh, for and against. Some period of time after it's implemented, those numbers in virtually every case reverse and the public um, appreciates the imp improvements to transit, the improvements to uh, uh, bike and pedestrian amenities, um, the reduction in traffic that makes streets so much more walkable and uh, um, uh, pleasant to be on, even as a driver. Um, and uh, um, I think there's been a reluctance to go through um, what will be uh, necessarily a very, very difficult process. Um, but I think it's one of the important things that we need to do um, uh, to cut back on, uh, on driving, to reduce the consumption of fossil fuels. Um, uh, uh, there's just, there's a lot of, uh, of good that could uh, come about uh, as a result of, of that. So that, that would be my number one, I think. Very good, much appreciated, uh, Mr. Assembly Member. Thank you. Good to see you. It's not, it's not a very good campaign issue, Louis. <laughs> oh, don't <laughs> because of that uh, first part. Uh, yeah. People hate it. You, you can expect <laughs> negativity. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe announce your support after you're elected. Um, someone asked, uh, do you ever plan to run for the Senate? Um, I can't. Um, unless the law changes, um, uh, we have 12 year uh, 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 maximum uh, uh, terms uh, and it's uh, in the Senate or the assembly, uh, you know, or the two combined. Um, so I've uh, uh, completed 10 years uh, uh, in the assembly and there's no way to run for a I can't fit a two-year term or four-year term into two years, so it's uh, it's it's not possible. Um, we also have I had a the Senate opportunity. In to, I had the opportunity to run for uh, uh, for Senate when uh, Henry Waxman uh, retired um, uh, back in my I think it was my uh, uh, second year in the Assembly, and I decided to, at that time to. Who, uh, and this is something uh, Ben Allen and I discussed. Um, he was going to run for assembly if I ran for Senate, vice versa. Um, and I decided to stay with the assembly because I had already built up a little bit of seniority there. I liked my committee assignments. Um, the downside is uh, uh, nobody knows what an assembly member is. Everybody knows what a senator is. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, that has some meaning uh, in politics, but uh, um, I'm pretty happy with the decision I made. That seniority did pay off, um, had a, a tenure uh, assignment uh, uh, as chair of budget subcommittee number three. Um, that allowed me to make a, a really big impact on environmental issues and transportation issues. And, and uh, it's something I'm really proud of. There's another Senate in Washington, D.C., by the way. <laughs> yes, I don't expect it. Well, I guess uh, one of those seats might uh, become available. Um, um, it's not likely, okay. but, you know, I'd never slam the door on anything. 
Well, given you don't know what you want to do next, uh, Mark Buxovich from our team. I didn't say I didn't asked, know what I wanted to do. I don't know what I will be doing. Fair enough. Well, we wanted to extend an offer to you. He uh, said if you if you know if you don't have much going on, or if you have some spare time, if you want to advise our state team on state legislation next year, uh, we would welcome you with open arms. I will always. Uh, you should consider me uh, a resource to you uh, now and uh, into the future. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that, that. If I'm a, if I'm a judge, um, I'll be uh, very uh, constrained in what I can do or not do. So you may, you know, wish that upon me or wish that that doesn't happen. <laughs> so we only have about a minute left. I wanted to just give you a space in case you'd like to say anything or um, anything else in your mind. Hey, um, I, I've really been impressed uh, with uh, how quickly your organization has come to the fore um, on, uh, you know, some of the more important issues that we that uh, we face in, in the region. So I really want to compliment you on uh, the work that you do, the advocacy that you bring. Um, we uh, we had an equally uh, um, rapid ascent on the other side of the ledger uh, by uh, uh, Livable California um, uh, that came into being just a couple of years back um, and has made a dramatically, in my opinion, uh, largely negative impact uh, on housing, not transportation, but on housing. Um, but still, you're sort of there as a counterweight to some of the other um, uh, perhaps antiquated thinking that's out there, and your voices are extremely important and, and helpful, and, uh, and you're doing a really good job. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for the time. Um, thanks for carrying uh, the bill that we worked on together this year. And yeah, was was, that done. was cool over your career. And we look forward to seeing what you do next and um, look forward to continued working relationship in whatever form that may be. Thanks, Michael. And uh, thank you all. Thanks, Richard. Good night, good everybody. Good work. Thank you. Good night. Good night.